Book One, Chapter Two of The Mill on the Floss. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The Mill on the Floss by George Eliot. Book One, Boy and Girl. Chapter Two. Mr. Tolliver of Dorcliffe Mill declares his resolution about Tom. "'What I want, you know,' said Mr. Tolliver, "'what I want is to give Tom a good education, an education as'll be a bread to him. That was what I was thinking of when I gave notice for him to leave the academy at Lady Day. I mean to put him to a downright good school at midsummer. The two years at the academy I'd had done well enough if I'd meant to make a miller and farmer of him, for he's had a fine sight more schoolin' nor I ever got. All the learnin' my father ever paid for was a bit of birch at one end and the alphabet at the other. But I should like Tom to be a bit of a scholard, so as he might be up to the tricks of these fellows as talk fine and write with a flourish. It'd be a help to me with these lawsuits and arbitrations and things. I wouldn't make a downright lawyer of the lad. I should be sorry for him to be a rascal. But a sort of engineer, or a surveyor, or an auctioneer and valier, like Riley, or one of them smartish businesses as are all profits and no outlay, only for a big watch chain and a high stool. They're pretty nigh all one, and they're not far off being even with the law, I believe. For Riley looks Lawyer Wakem in the face as hard as one cat looks another. He's none frightened at him. Mr. Tolliver was speaking to his wife, a blonde, comely woman in a fan shaped cap. I'm afraid to think how long it is since fan shaped caps were worn. They must be so near coming in again. At that time, when Mrs. Tolliver was nearly forty, they were new at St. Ogg's, and considered sweet things. "'Well, Mr. Tulliver, you know best. I've no objections. But hadn't I better kill a couple of fowl and have aunts and uncles to dinner next week, so as you may hear what Sister Glegg and Sister Pullet have got to say about it? There's a couple of fowl once killing.' "'You may kill every fowl of the yard if you like, Bessie. But I shall ask neither aunt nor uncle what I'm to do with me own lad,' said Mr. Tulliver, defiantly. "'Dear heart!' said Mrs. Tulliver, shocked at the sanguinary rhetoric. "'How can you talk so, Mr. Tulliver? "'But it's your way to speak disrespectful of my family, "'and Sister Glegg throws all the blame upon me, "'though I'm sure I'm as innocent as the babe unborn. "'For nobody's ever heard me say "'as it wasn't lucky for my children to have aunts and uncles "'as can live independent. "'However, if Tom's to go to a new school, "'I should like him to go where I can wash him and mend him, "'else he might as well have calico as linen, "'for they'd be one as yellow as t'other "'before they'd been washed half a dozen times.' "'And then, when the box is going backward and forward, "'I could send the lad a cake, or a pork pie, or an apple, "'for he can do with an extra bit, bless him, "'whether they stint him at the meals or no. "'My children can eat as much victuals as most, thank God.' "'Well, well, we won't send Mada Reach to the carrier's cart "'if other things fit in,' said Mr. Tulliver. "'But you mustn't put a spoke of the wheel about the washin' "'if we can't get a school near enough. "'That's the fault I have to find with you, Bessie. "'If you see a stick of the road, you're allus thinkin' you can't step over it. "'You'd want me not to hire a good wagoner, "'cause he's got a mole on his face.' "'Dear heart,' said Mrs. Tulliver, in mild surprise, "'when did I ever make objections to a man "'because he'd got a mole on his face? "'I'm sure I'm rather fond of the moles, "'for my brother, as is dead and gone, "'had a mole on his brow. "'But I can't remember your ever offering "'to hire a wagoner with a mole, Mr. Tulliver. "'There was John Gibbs hadn't a mole on his face, "'no more nor you have, "'and I was all for having you hire him, "'and so you did hire him.' "'and if he hadn't to die to the inflammation "'as we paid Dr. Turnbull for attending him, "'he'd very like have been driving the wagon now. "'He might have a mole somewhere out of sight. "'But how was I to know that, Mr. Tulliver?' "'No, no, Bessie, I didn't mean justly the mole. "'I meant it to stand for summat else. "'But never mind, it's puzzling work talking is. "'What I'm thinking on is how to find the right sort of school "'to send Tom to, for I might be ta'en in again "'as I've been with the Academy.' "'I'll have nothing to do with Academy again. "'Whatever school I send Tom to, it shan't be Academy. "'It shall be a place where the lads spend their time "'as summat else besides blacking the family's shoes "'and getting up the potatoes. "'It's an uncommon puzzling thing to know what school to pick.' "'Mr. Tulliver paused a minute or two, "'and dived with both hands into his breeches' pocket, "'as if he hoped to find some suggestion there. "'Apparently he was not disappointed, "'for he presently said, "'I know what I'll do. "'I'll talk it over with Riley.' "'He's coming to-morrow, to arbitrate about the dam.' 
Well, Mr. Tulliver, I've put the sheets out for the best bed, and Casey has got em hanging at the fire. They aren't the best sheets, but they're good enough for anybody to sleep in, be he who he will. For as for them best Holland sheets, I should repent buying em, only they'll do to lay us out in. And if you was to die to-morrow, Mr. Tulliver, they're mangled beautiful, and all ready, and smell a lavender as it ud be a pleasure to lay em out. And they lie at the left-hand corner of the big oak linen chest at the back, not as I should trust anybody to look em out but myself." As Mrs. Tulliver uttered the last sentence, she drew a bright bunch of keys from her pocket, and singled out one, rubbing her thumb and finger up and down it with a placid smile, while she looked at the clear fire. If Mr. Tulliver had been a susceptible man in his conjugal relation, he might have supposed that she drew out the key to aid her imagination, in anticipating the moment when he would be in a state to justify the production of the best Holland sheets. Happily he was not so. He was only susceptible in respect of his right to water-power. Moreover, he had the marital habit of not listening very closely, and since his mention of Mr. Riley, had been apparently occupied in a tactile examination of his woollen stockings. "'I think I've hit it, Bessie,' was his first remark after a short silence. "'Riley's as likely a man as any to know o' some school. He's had schooling himself, and goes about to all sorts of places, arbitratin' and valiant and that. And we shall have time to talk it over to-morrow night, when the business is done.' I want Tom to be such sort of man as Riley, you know, as can talk pretty nigh as well as if it was all wrote out for him, and knows a good lot o' words as don't mean much, so as he can't lay hold of em in law, and a good solid knowledge of business, too." "'Well,' said Mrs. Tulliver, "'so far as talking proper, and knowing everything, and walking with a bend in his back, and setting his hair up, I shouldn't mind the lad being brought up to that. But them fine talkin' men from the big towns mostly wear the false shirt-fronts. They wear a frill till it's all a mess, and then hide it with a bib. I know Riley does. And then if Tom's to go and live at Mudport, like Riley, he'll have a house with a kitchen hardly big enough to turn in, and never get a fresh egg for his breakfast, and sleep up three pair of stairs, or four for what I know, and be burnt to death before he can get down." "'No, no,' said Mr. Tulliver. I've no thoughts of his going to Mudport. I mean him to set up his office at St. Ogg's, close by us, and live at home. "'But,' continued Mr. Tulliver, after a pause, "'what I'm a bit afraid on is, as Tom hasn't got the right sort of brains for a smart fellow. I doubt he's a bit slowish. He takes after your family, Bessie." "'Yes, that he does,' said Mrs. Tulliver, accepting the last proposition entirely on its own merits. "'He's wonderful for liking a deal of salt in his broth. That was my brother's way, and my father's before him.' "'It seems a pity, though,' said Mr. Tulliver as the lad should take after the mother's side instead of the little wench. That's the worst on it with crossing a breeze. You can never justly calculate what'll come on't. The little un takes after my side now. She's twice as cute as Tom. Too cute for a woman, I'm afraid," continued Mr. Tulliver, turning his head dubiously first on one side, and then on the other. It's no mischief much while she's a little un, but an over-cute woman's no better nor a long-tailed sheep. She'll fetch none the bigger price for that. Yes, it is a mischief while she's a little un, Mr. Tulliver, for it runs to naughtiness. How to keep her in a clean pinafore two hours together passes my cunning. And now you put me a mind," continued Mrs. Tulliver, rising and going to the window. I don't know where she is now, and it's pretty nigh tea-time. Oh, I thought so, wandering up and down by the water like a wild thing. She'll tumble in some day. Mrs. Tulliver rapped the window sharply, beckoned, and shook her head a process which she repeated more than once before she returned to her chair. "'You talk of cuteness, Mr. Tulliver,' she observed as she sat down. "'But I'm sure the child's half an idiot of some things. For if I send her upstairs to fetch anything, she forgets what she's gone for, and perhaps will sit on the floor in the sunshine and plait her hair and sing to herself like a bedlam creature, all the while I'm waiting for her downstairs. That never run in my family, thank God. No more nor a brown skin as makes her look like a merlotter. I don't like to fly the face of Providence, but it seems hard as I should have but one gill, and her so comical." "'Pooh! Nonsense!' said Mr. Tulliver. "'She's a straight, black-eyed wench as anybody need wish to see. I don't know what she's behind other folks' children, and she could read almost as well as the parson. But her hair won't curl all I can do with it, and she's so franzy about having it put in paper, and I've such work as never was to make her stand and have it pinched with irons. Cut it off! "'Cut it off short,' said the father, rashly. "'How can you talk so, Mr. Tulliver? She's too big a girl, gone nine and tall of her age, to have her hair cut short. 
and there's her cousin Lucy's got a row of curls round her head, and not a hair out of place. It seems hard as my sister Dean should have that pretty child. I'm sure Lucy takes more after me nor my own child does. Maggie, Maggie, continued the mother, in a tone of calf-coaxing fretfulness, as this small mistake of nature entered the room. Where's the use of my telling you to keep away from the water? You'll tumble in and be drowned some day, and then you'll be sorry you didn't do as mother told you. Maggie's hair, as she threw off her bonnet, painfully confirmed her mother's accusation. Mrs. Tulliver, desiring her daughter to have a curled crop, like other folks' children, had had it cut too short in front to be pushed behind the ears, and as it was usually straight an hour after it had been taken out of paper, Maggie was incessantly tossing her head to keep the dark, heavy locks out of her gleaming black eyes, an action which gave her very much the air of a small Shetland pony. "'Oh, dear, oh, dear, Maggie, what are you thinking of to throw your bonnet down there? Take it upstairs, there's a good gel, and let your hair be brushed, and put your other pinafore on, and change your shoes, do for shame, and come and go on with your patchwork like a little lady.' "'Oh, mother,' said Maggie, in a vehemently cross tone, "'I don't want to do my patchwork.' "'What? Not your pretty patchwork to make a counterpane for your Aunt Glegg?' "'It's foolish work,' said Maggie, with a toss of her mane, "'tearing things to pieces to sew em together again. And I don't want to do anything for my Aunt Glegg. I don't like her.' Exit Maggie, dragging her bonnet by the string, while Mr. Tulliver laughs audibly. "'I wonder at you as you'll laugh at her, Mr. Tulliver,' said the mother, with feeble fretfulness in her tone. "'You encourage her in naughtiness, and her aunts will have it as it's me spoils her.' Mrs. Tulliver was what is called a good-tempered person, never cried when she was a baby, on any slighter ground than hunger and pins, and from the cradle upward had been healthy, fair, plump, and dull-witted, in short the flower of her family for beauty and amiability. But milk and mildness are not the best things for keeping, and when they turn only a little sour, they may disagree with young stomachs seriously. I have often wondered whether those early Madonnas of Raphael, with the blond faces and somewhat stupid expression, keep their placidity undisturbed when their strong-limbed, strong-willed boys got a little too old to do without clothing. I think they must have been given to feeble remonstrance, getting more and more peevish as it became more and more ineffectual. End of Book One, Chapter Two